Hello. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. It is just me today. Sorry to disappoint. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> okay, a couple of, I do have a couple of toppers, so bear with me for a second. So on September 7th, the President and Dr. Biden will host President and Mrs. Obama for the unveiling ceremony for their official White House portraits. That'll be very exciting. Today, the White House passed the Chips and Science Act with a bipartisan vote and a no Democrats voting no. This bill will lower the cost of goods. It will make cars, dishwashers, computers, and more, and more cheaper. It will create high-paying manufacturing jobs around the country and strengthen our industries of, of the future. It will strengthen our supply chains and national security because we will be able to make these critical technologies at home. And it includes important guardrails to ensure these dollars are invested here in America. There's exactly, this is exactly what we need to do to grow our economy right now. The President looks forward to signing the CHIPS and Science Act as soon as possible. And like you heard the President underline today, we need to pass the Inflation Reduction Act as soon as possible because this is a once-in-a-lifetime chance to fight inflation and lower costs like prescription drugs, energy, and health care. This will build on the unprecedented deficit reduction we achieved by having the wealthy pay their share and make, sh make crucial progress against the climate crisis that threatens our economy and national security, creating thousands of jobs in the process. And already, a host of economic health care and climate experts of many different viewpoints have endorsed this as the right plan to help the middle class right now. This is all about whether we're going to stand up for the middle class families against the pain from the global problem of inflation and cut the costs of drugs and energy and the deficit. Or are we going to stand against middle class families and instead protect tax welfare for, for hedge fund managers, big farmers' ability to price gouge, multi-billion dollar corporations seeing record profits and who game the system to pay no taxes or wealth tax cheat. It's critical for our country that we pass it as soon as possible. Final thing for all of you is our hearts go out to the people of the south of southwestern Kentucky, which is experiencing considerable flash flooding that has taken the lives of multiple people. FEMA Administrator Criswell spoke to Kentucky Governor Bashir this morning and committed to providing support from federal government. She will travel to Kentucky tomorrow to survey storm damage and report back to President Biden, who has been briefed on the situation. Search and rescue operations are ongoing right now, and FEMA has dispatched an incident management assistant team and rescue personnel to assist with those efforts. We are grateful for the heroic work of first responders and would urge everyone impacted in impacted areas to please listen to their state and local officials and follow their guidance. And with that, Song Ming, you want to kick us off? Uh, two questions on two topics. Um, first on the Xi call, um, Beijing said in its readout of the call that President Xi told President Biden that, quote, those who play with fire will perish by it. So does the White House consider that as an escalation by China? I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to speak to uh, that statement, uh, that comment that you just read out. But I, let me give you a little bit of what was uh, discussed and a little bit of um, of the call, some, some specifics. So the President was joined by National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, uh, Principal Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer, Kurt Campbell, and Laura Rosenberger. The two, two leaders spoke for two hours and 20 minutes. This call has been in the works for quite some time. Uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan proposed this call in June during his meeting with his P PRC counterpart as part of our efforts to maintain open lines of communication and management uh, the relationship responsibly. I'll say this, um, they had a, a very direct um, conversation um, and that uh, they've known each other for some time. The President has known, President Biden has known President Xi for about four decades. 
This is a relationship that they've had for some time. And again, it was a direct, straightforward uh, conversation. Uh, this is something you hear from the president all the time, and the importance of having leader-to-leader -leader, uh, conversation. Uh, but again, I'm not going to uh, speak, speak to or, or characterize uh, what was just stated. And on one domestic question, the president said repeatedly in recent days that if Congress does not act on climate, that he would. So if the Manchin-Schumer deal gets signed into law, um, does that mean that the president would not declare a climate emergency? So the first, I, I'll say this, um, the last time the president traveled, as you all know, some of your colleagues traveled with him to Somerset, Massachusetts, and he was at the coal-powered uh, uh, facility that shut down back in 2017. Uh, he then said climate change is an emergency, and, this, and he called it an act of urgency at the time. Uh, and he has done that throughout the 18 months uh, when he walked into the administration he called he said that climate was a crisis was one of the crises that we had to deal with uh, and so he had said uh, if Congress didn't act to your point uh, he would he would take action but right now we are glad to see uh, that Congress had has heeded the call uh, and most significant as we have said the most significant investment uh, to climate uh, to climate change to fight climate change that we have seen uh, in history in US history and he is he walked welcomes that, uh, but the president has been acting on the climate crisis since day one, uh, taking bold action, a decisive action, uh, to make sure that we uh, deal uh, with this crisis, with this uh, emergency. So he'll continue to do that, uh, even though we, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is progress, and we are we welcome it, and the president wants to sign it. Uh, again, it is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's a game changer. It's historical. Uh, he's not going to stop uh, taking action uh, on climate. Uh, on Russia, Moscow has not accepted your substantial proposal to release Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan. Is there any concern that by going public with this offer now that you showed your hand too soon? So uh, I'll say this, you know, Brittany Griner is wrongfully, uh, is wrongly detained. Uh, Paul Whelan is wrongly detained. And the president has been very clear about this. He wants to make sure that they come home. Uh, and he has made this a top priority. His national security has made this a top priority. So has Secretary Blinken, as you all heard from him yesterday as you're asking me about um, the substantial uh, offer that's been put on the table. Uh, I don't want to go into details about that. As you as you imagine, uh, in order to have success, uh, we need to not negotiate in public. So I'm just going to leave that there. Just so I understand, is this still a negotiation, or is this your best and final offer that you all have put out? I, 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 I really cannot go. Just for the, the privacy and the, the safety of, uh, of the process, uh, I cannot I cannot say more. But we are sharing that we did put a substantial offer on the table. We wanted to be uh, we, we wanted to to show that this president is taking it very seriously, just like he did uh, with uh, uh, Trevor Reed. And uh, but we're not going to go into details from here. Is there anything you're ruling out? For instance, is sanctions relief off the table? I'm not going to get into details from here. So not off the table? I'm not going to get into I'm not going to negotiate from here. We just cannot negotiate from here. All right. Thanks, Mary. Okay. In the call today, did the two leaders succeed in lowering tensions? Um, you know, I'll say I'll say this. Let me just share a little bit about what they covered, the, the three issues that they covered. Um, again, this was a straightforward um, uh, conversation that they had. They've had a relationship for many decades. This is the fifth call uh, that the president has had uh, with President Xi. They wanted to make sure that they continued the dialogues, kept the uh, open uh, open lines for conversation, and that's what we saw today. Uh, again, it was a more than a two-hour call, uh, but I'll share a little bit of what they covered. Uh, the first was a detailed discussion of areas where the two countries can work together, uh, with particular focus on climate change and health security and counter, and counter nar narcotics. The two teams will be following up on these areas. Areas. President Biden also raised the need to resolve the cases of American citizens who are wrongfully detained or subject to exit bans in China, as well as longstanding concerns about human rights. Second, they exchange views on Russia's war in Ukraine and the global impacts it is having. And then on Taiwan, uh, President Biden underscored that the United States policy has not changed and that
that the United States strongly opposes unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. President Biden also raised the need to resolve the cases of American citizens who are wrongly detained or subject to ex exit bans in China, as well as longstanding concerns about human rights. So those are the three uh, components that they, they, they discussed. We were told they, they discussed the possibility of a face-to-face -face summit meeting. Is that something you'd like to do before the end of the year? Is there any sort of time frame on that? Uh, we don't have anything on the president's schedule to, to share. Uh, as you know, and I just stated this, the president um, really, truly appreciates a leader-to-leader -leader, uh, interaction. Uh, he's been a senator. He's been a vice president. He knows, uh, and now president, uh, he knows the importance of having that. I, I don't have anything to share more than that. Just one more on that call yeah, sure. um, on President Biden raising, you said, long-standing concerns about human rights with President Xi. Can you tell us anything more about that specific portion of the call, and specifically whether he raised the issue of the treatment of Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region? So I can tell you that uh, he raised um, uh, genocide and forced labor practices uh, by the P PRC. That is something that he raised, um, and he, uh, about the human rights, as he always does. This is, uh, as we've said, that. Anytime the president has an opportunity, he raises that when he meets uh, with another leader and called on PRC to seize its ongoing human rights abuses uh, across China. Can you tell us a, a little bit about how President Xi responded to that? Um, they would have to respond uh, on their own. I cannot speak for, for President Xi. And just one more on a separate topic. Um, when President Biden was talking about the Manchin Schumer deal uh, earlier, he mentioned that there were some similarities there with Build Back Better, but this obviously wasn't a deal that had everything that Democrats initially wanted. Are there pieces of Build Back Better that are not in this new deal that the president plans on actively pursuing going forward? So right now we're going to focus on um, the the deal that's in front of us, the Inflation the Inflation Reduction Act. We, the president said this, uh, it is uh, now is the time. We believe now is the time to act. It is historic. Uh, as we know, it is going to, uh, one of the things that we have not discussed, it's going to uh, bring down the cost of uh, pharmaceutical drugs, which is so incredibly important as we think about our families, as we think about our seniors, uh, something that he has been working on since he was a senator, something that is incredibly uh, personal to him, uh, bringing down those costs, making sure that Medicare is able uh, uh, to negotiate uh, in order to bring those costs down. Uh, and so this is uh, historic. Uh, this is important. This is going to change so many lives of everyday people, of middle class America. And so that is what's important to us. What's important to us is what does this mean uh, for you know our, our grandparents? What does this need mean for families who are struggling? This will ease the cost, the high cost that they are paying, uh, this will uh, really have an effect on their health care. And so that is the president's focus. Uh, once we have anything more to add to what could be next, uh, we'll share that. Um, on, on that note, this is being called the Inflation Reduction Act. But I think when people think about inflation, they're thinking about the high cost of rent, of housing, of groceries, of gas. Um, what does this bill do to address those concerns? Because as you mentioned, the president's been working on those other issues for a long time, which suggests that those prices have already been high for a long time. What about the immediate concerns right now? So one thing I would say is you have heard the president have talk about his inflation plan. You've heard him talk about how he understands the anxiety that families are, are feeling about the economy, uh, what they're feeling uh, about uh, the high cost, uh, which is why he's taken action on gas prices, uh, which is why we have seen uh, gas prices come down in a historic fashion, if you look at the last the last decade. Um, and it's at 70 cents per gallon. That's about more, a little bit more than $70 per month for families who have two, uh, two cars and a household that means a lot I know that uh, there's a lot more to be to be done and we're we're going to uh, uh we're going to, we, see, we believe, more uh, of a decrease. But what families pay at the pump does matter. Uh, what families pay uh, at the drug pharmaceutical companies matter. I mean, we have Americans here who are paying uh, for a drug two times, three times more than folks in another country. I mean, that should not be. So that does matter, uh, lowering costs for millions and millions and millions of people. Uh, and so experts have said um, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, and they will tell you that the, when, when you uh, when you look at uh, this uh, 
this bill, this act, uh, it will indeed help fight uh, inflation. It will indeed uh, help reduce the deficit. So the experts are saying that as well. Okay. Thank you, Karine. Um, today the president argued that the economy is not in a recession. And it was a year ago that the president said that inflation would be temporary. So the question is, why should Americans take his word for it now when the president got it wrong on the economy a year ago? So here's, you know, when we talk about recession and we talk about where we are currently uh, today, what we look at and what we speak to is uh, the facts, is what other, uh, other experts are saying and what the textbook definition uh, is of recession. And if you look at the pre-recession years uh, during, uh, in our history, uh, you see that the thing that happens during a pre-recession is, the, the, is that you lose jobs. And we're not seeing that currently. We are, it, it is not what is happening. The labor market it has gained jobs. If you look at the first six months, 2.7 million uh, jobs have been created under the president's watch. Nine million new jobs have been created the last quarter, 1.2 million jobs. And we're seeing the resiliency of business investment. We're seeing the resiliency of consumer uh, buying power. And that matters. Those are the broad factors uh, that we look at. But Karine, what do you say to Americans who say, this is really a discussion about semantics. Whatever you want to call it, you have Americans all across the country who say it is hard for them to make ends meet every month. They're hurting. And this is, this is a president who understands that. We have talked about that. We have talked about how we understand what the American people are feeling. We understand what the, that conversation they are having around the kitchen table about how they're going to, uh, how they're going to uh, deal with uh, cost. And, but that is why, that is why uh, we are a asking Congress to act on this uh, Inflationary Reduction Act. And let's not forget, I just talked about chips and how that is going to make difference in lower costs. When you think about the semiconductors, right, you think about how the prices of automobiles shot up during, uh, during the pandemic, and now we're going to be able to make that here. That is a big deal. That is incredibly important as well. The President run the risk of, of looking out of touch in this moment by digging in on this definition that this moment is not a recession, if in fact at some point it's determined that that's exactly I, what's You know, happened. I have to tell you, Kristen, I don't think we're digging in. We're being asked. You know, we're being told, and you know, every day I've come in here, I've been asked, so Kareem, what, you know, is this a recession? So we're answering the question. Uh, we're, we're, we're using the facts to answer the question. We're using economists who have said, uh, hey, this, this, for example, Chair, Chair Powell has said, I do not think the U.S. is currently in a recession. There's just too many areas in the economy that are performing well. And that matters as well as we are trying to explain uh, to the American people. And just very quickly, has the president spoken to Senator Sinema? Is it his expectation that she is going to support this piece of legislation? So I, ref I refer you to Senator Sinema. Uh, the negotiations, I, I, we do not have a call to read out to you at this time. Um, I would refer you to her and also Senator Schumer, who's doing the negotiations. Have her as a part of these negotiations? Uh, again, I would refer you to Senator Schumer, who's been leading the negotiations. Okay. Thanks, Green. Uh, on the phone today, did President Biden ask President Xi anything about getting to the bottom of the origins of COVID? Uh, so the, on the origins of COVID, the two presidents uh, did discuss the health security and transparency is key part of that. Uh, as we have repeatedly said, the PRC is not living up to scientific and public health norms for data and information sharing. We have said this before, so that is nothing new. And we are the international community. We've said this needs more data. They need more information uh, to make clear the d determination. Uh, uh, on the origins of the pandemic. We continue to work with our partners around the world to, to press China uh, to fully share information and to cooperate with the World Health Organization. So this has come up many times I know before. It's come up before, but it came up today. I'm just saying that the two president did discuss health security. That, that did come up. Okay, did the president ask uh, Xi about the findings of that congressional investigation that the Chinese were trying to infiltrate the Federal Reserve over the last couple of years? We don't, I, we don't have anything to share on that. Okay. Beyond, uh, beyond the, uh, the readout that you all got. On a different topic, the D.C. mayor sent the White House a letter asking for National Guard help 
with migrants that have been bused here from Texas and Arizona. Is the president going to approve that request for the National Guard? So as uh, to your question on the National Guard, I refer you to the Department of Defense. They will have uh, that answer for you. Uh, we have been in regular touch with Mayor Bowser and her team. Uh, and I said this before. I said this last week about Republicans using migrants uh, as a political tool, uh, and that is shameful, and that is just wrong. Uh, there is a process in place for managing migrants at the border. This is not it, what they're doing currently. Uh, that, that includes expelling migrants as required by court order under Title Title 42, uh, transferring them to ICE custody or placing them in the care of local NGOs as they await for the pro pro uh, processing. Again, so what Republicans are doing, the way that they're meddling in the process and using uh, migrants as a political pawn is just wrong. So the White House's preference would be for small towns in Texas and Arizona to have to take care of these migrants rather than a large metropolitan that city like Washington, That is not what I said. That is not what I said. That is what that, you said. No, you that said, not, you said that there migrants. is. Yeah, they are. They're sending migrants to big cities on purpose, so using they, them as a political ploy. So if they don't go to big cities, where should they there's go? There's a process. I just there's laid a, it out. There's, there's a, process, a process. And they come to a big city, and now that, that the is, mayor says she needs the National Guard. That's so, because that's because Republicans are using they're using migrants who are coming here for who knows uh, because they are they're they're dealing with humanitarian issues back in their uh, country they're coming here for a better life and they are being used peter they're being used by republican governors does, that is what's happening does any of this just make the president want to say this is causing a lot of burdens on small cities big cities maybe i should just close the border what i'm saying is what republicans are doing is wrong and there is a process in place and we should follow the process there's a legal process in place and they should follow it okay thank you Good. Good to you. Okay, sure. Um, I, I did want to go back to the question about uh, the title of the bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, just to nail it down here, then the, if you're on Medicare, the bill offers a potential benefit. If you were in the market for an electric vehicle, the bill offers a potential benefit. If you want to put solar panels in your home, the uh, bill offers a potential benefit. But, but will the bill, if enacted, actually have an impact on the price of rent, on food, on some of the other things that, that has, have seen prices go up in the current inflationary dynamic? It, it's a good question. Right now, it, what we're seeing in the, in, in, the, uh, in the act deals with health care, right, and climate. Uh, which are important things in lowering costs, uh, creating jobs, uh, and making lives better for the middle class. That is, we should not uh, we should not downplay that. That is uh, historic again, and that is going to be uh, going to really help a lot of families who are struggling at the time at this time. Uh, if if we go back to the American Rescue Plan, the president has uh, proposed and has um, uh, has components of that American American Rescue Plan that helped with housing affordability. Uh, which is also very important. And the work that the president has done uh, just uh, across the 18 months with the American Rescue Plan, with the bipartisan infrastructure uh, legislation are, is also, it's not just this piece, there are multiple pieces uh, that is going to make a real dent uh, in what Americans are going through right now. Remember, the reason why we're going through this is because of outside impact that we're seeing, right? We're seeing variants uh, of COVID that has happened. We're seeing the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so there are outside factors that have led to the inflation that we're currently seeing. So one quick other question on this topic. Uh, can you shed a little bit more light on uh, the, the White House's involvement in the crafting of the bill? Senator Manchin this morning said that he went out of his way to avoid involving the president directly. So, you know, the president um, ha has been in, in touch with many members in Congress. Uh, and in, he has not been directly, as he has said, uh, negotiating, but he has been in touch with them. Uh, we have a whole White House uh, team here uh, who have uh, had direct communication uh, with folks on Congress about what they need, what they needed uh, for with this legislation, and that continues, and that has been happening uh, these past several months. I'm just not going to go into further detail on private conversation. Go ahead, Nancy. Just two questions. Um, what did President Biden tell President Xi about Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, and how has he personally asked Speaker Pelosi not to go on that trip? So I can tell you this. Look, I, there's a separation of power, right? There is two equal co, two, two co-equal governments. Uh, the president was a, a member of Congress for 36 years. He understands what that means, uh, and he knows that this is not 
he cannot say, tell a member of Congress what they can or cannot do. Um, so that is, uh, uh, that is something that the President gets uh, very well. Now, secondly, there has not been a trip that has been announced. I cannot speak to the Speaker's schedule. Uh, she has to speak to her own schedule. Uh, again, as we have said multiple times, uh, when a congressional member uh, thinks about having a trip or wants to go on a trip, uh, an international trip, uh, we give them the advice that on the geopol geopolitical uh, assessment, on national security uh, assessment, and it is up to them uh, to make that decision. Just one more thing. Um, based on today's GDP report, China now will have a faster economic growth than the U.S. this year. I'm wondering how the White House feels about that. Uh, look, I'll say. Look, I'll say this, um, and I'll quote uh, Secretary Yellen um, on 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 what we saw today with um, with the GDP. So there, are a, and she said this earlier during her press conference. There are a variety of risks ahead, like Russia's war, COVID lockdowns in China, and more. We have strengths in the economy, a strong labor market being one strength. Consumer household balance sheets remain generally strong. Credit uh, quality is strong. You do not see some significant increase in businesses, uh, bankruptcies. Uh, these would be the typical kinds of distress we associate with recession. That was what she said about recession. As to uh, China, look, we also passed, uh, the House just passed the CHIPS uh, the CHIPS uh, Act, which is going to be, which is going to make a difference, which is going to help us make us more competitive uh, with uh, with China. Uh, it is a huge, huge game changer, uh, if you will, with investing, having manufacturers invest here, uh, dealing with our supply chain. Remember, one of the issues that we have had with supply, uh, with inflation, are uh, the supply chain due to uh, the pandemic. So this will help with that. This will create jobs. Uh, all of these things are going to matter. Uh, in the in the upcoming months as well, sure. Michael. I have a. I actually have an answer t for you. I'll, I'll give it to you right now if you want. Uh, <laughs> I remembered. I remembered. Well, now let's see. Well, no, he asked me a question a couple days ago, and I was like, I gotta get that question. I answer to him. So you had asked earlier about federal efforts uh, to protect communities impacted by extreme heat in the Pacific Northwest, in particular. So I, I just wanted to follow up uh, with some information specific to that region because I know McClatchy has a lot of uh, other newspapers under your under your umbrella. So as the Pacific Northwest continues to, to face a dangerous and persistent heat wave, the President has directed his team to take swift and aggressive action to protect communities. Federal agencies are working uh, with state and local partners in Oregon and Washington to provide clear and accessible information on how people can protect themselves from extreme heat. Uh, for instance, multiple National Weather Service forecast offices across the Pacific Northwest have been regularly briefed emergency management partners on the expected impacts, and we are deploying more than $7 million throughout this summer to Oregon and Washington to help lower uh, cooling costs for low-income households, open cooling centers, and buy, distribute, or, or loan efficient air conditioning equipment. And you still get a question. I'm just answering the question that you asked, and I said that I would get back to you. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, on another topic, um, Venezuela's Nic uh, Nicolas Maduro has a, has a close ally named Alex Saab who's facing uh, federal charges uh, in a U.S. court. He wants Alex Saab to be released. In that context, the Venezuelans this year have, uh, <coughs> separate from the two Vene uh, Americans who have been detained in Venezuela that the administration secured their release, separate from those two, Venezuela has detained four Americans so far this year um, that your administration believes is wrong for you to take. Yeah. With the president signaling uh, that he is clearly willing to conduct prisoner swaps, uh, whether it be Trevor Reed, and I know you won't go into the details of this offer with Britton Greiner or Paul Whelan, but with the president signaling that, how should dictators around the world, like Nicolas Maduro, for anyone else, uh, read read that. Is the bazaar open, and is there, you know, a value on American lives? So I'll say this: uh, we don't think that um, there's an in there's an incentive, right? Because we're doing this for uh, uh, for um, 
for countries to continue to take more hostage. That's I know we've gotten that question, so I just wanted to answer that. Uh, but we also think um, by we also think that it's also critical to to dis, to um, to deter and disrupt hostage taking and wrongful detentions in the future to prevent more Americans and their families from going through this terrible ordeal. So that's why a couple of weeks ago we announced a series of actions to expand the toolkit uh, the U.S. government can can use to do that, including the ability to impose serious costs and consequences, uh, such as sanctions and visa bans on governments and non-state actors who are involved uh, in hostage takings and wrongful, uh, wrong, wrongful detentions. The State Department also just introduced a new risk indicator to their travel advisories to inform U.S. citizens about the risk of wrongful detention by a foreign government in six countries that have regularly engaged in that in the space. So I just wanted to talk about what we are doing currently, what we have announced. Look, the president has been very clear. Uh, he is going to do everything that he can to make sure that U.S. nationals who are wrongfully uh, detained come home. And I think what you're seeing with uh, his action um, and this offer, uh, the substantial offer that's on the table with Brittany Griner and uh, with Paul Weiner shows uh, that he is willing to take those actions, and even with uh, Trevor Reed. Uh, so this is uh, this is something that the president takes very seriously, uh, and uh, he's just he's going to continue to act. Corinne. Corinne. I'll, I'll come to the back. I'll come to uh, the back. I had a question. Uh, if, does the president have another plan for passing aid to veterans exposed to burn pits? Uh, now that the Senate Republicans blocked that bill, you know, comedian John Stewart's on the Hill, you know, yeah. uh, talking about that. Well, I have to say, it is uh, very disappointing to see what Republicans are doing uh, on the Hill. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we had 84 senators, uh, Democrats, and uh, Republicans voted for the PACT Act. It was a bipartisan process that was moving forward. But now, uh, you see Senate Republicans are playing politics, and they're denying veterans the health care. Uh, and not just the health care, but the benefits uh, they have earned the benefits that they have earned, the folks who have put their lives uh, at risk to protect us. Uh, this is what they're doing, uh, these Republic, Republican senators. So we want to be very clear here. Veterans and their families are facing a stark reality. Uh, as uh, Congress stands by, uh, veterans are, are dying from toxic expo exposures, as we know. Uh, so we cannot wait any longer, and Congress needs to pass the PACT Act immediately. And that's the message that we're going to, to send. One, one other question, if I could, about, about the call today. Can you just share whether uh, the President feels any progress was made on uh, lifting tariffs against China? Any progress on when that may happen? So I don't have anything new uh, to share. So the president did explain uh, on his decision, but the president did explain his core concerns uh, with China's unfair economic practices uh, that harm uh, American workers and families. Uh, but again, they, not, they did not discuss uh, any potential steps he might take uh, with President Xi that has not uh, been decided. So I'm not going to get ahead of the president. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll go to the back after. I'm so sorry. Yep, we'll get there. The Manchin-Schumer deal announced last night does away with the president's proposed by American tax credits for electric vehicles, and it expands the idea to include vehicles assembled in Canada and Mexico. Does the president support this change, considering how important it was for him to prioritize vehicles assembled in the U.S. with union labor? Well, let's not forget the bipartisan infrastructure uh, uh, law that uh, also addresses uh, electric vehicles and is, is a, also a big historic investment. Uh, look, the way that we see this, you heard from the president this earlier today, this is a one it's a lifetime opportunity. This is going to be uh, a game changer for many Americans. And so he supports uh, this piece of legislation, and he wants to see it pass so he can sign it. Me? All right, go ahead, Chris, and then I'll yeah, go back. Uh, there's some concerns like, um, on the Hill among Republicans who feel like they're sort of blindsided by this announcement. Um, mm -hmm yesterday afternoon mm -hmm. and that it could make it more difficult for them to get the votes together to do things like you know working in in a bipartisan fashion things like codifying uh, same-sex marriage does the does the president share any of that concern concern that now that that announcement is out it after getting the, the gun bill done together after doing chips that that maybe now that 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 we've moved beyond that phase and they won't be able to get things. So I'll say this, I mean, 
I'm not going to, to speak to um, the mechanism or the decision of, of uh, which bill comes first, how it was decided. That is something that uh, I would refer you to Senator Schumer uh, in the Senate. Uh, but I, what I will say is that the president has been uh, like the tip of the spear when it comes to marriage equality. Uh, and uh, he very much supports it. We put forward a SAP uh, just last week saying that we support uh, the marriage equality uh, bill that has been put forward. And he is going to continue to encourage uh, Congress to, to pass it. Uh, you know, it's not over. I think negotiations are still happening. And uh, we'll see where this lands. But again, we this is something that he strongly supports. Uh, he was uh, out ahead of so many people uh, during his uh, days in, in the Senate and uh, also as vice president. And so he's going to continue to fight for it and speak out. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. So uh, just to follow up on my colleague's questions on the Speaker Pelosi's trip, um, I know that you don't speak for the Speaker, and you've also mentioned several times that the White House has no control over uh, the travels of lawmakers. But if you could please um, speak to help us understand why is there such a public disagreement between the President and the Speaker on this very sensitive foreign policy issue that you know, pretty much everybody in Washington is now weighing on? If you could just help us understand like, what's going on and the, the, di the dynamic between the two of them. Well, there's no dynamic. There is no public disagreement between the President and the Speaker. There, there is none. I mean, we have been pretty clear, and we have said there's no trip that has been announced. Uh, and uh, we have said that we leave it to the speaker to make that decision. That's what I just said. You know, the president uh, has been a senator for 36 years. He understands how this process works, uh, and it is not up to him to make that decision for where the speaker goes. Uh, so there is no public disagreement. Uh, that is not something that you have seen from here. Uh, that is uh, certainly being played out there uh, in in the world. But again, we have we have been very very clear uh, about this process and how this goes. But it's hard to speak to uh, something that has just not been announced. And I do not. Again, as you just stated uh, when you asked me this question, I do not speak for the speaker in her travel. Can I just follow up on another uh, related issue on the. Um the readout that the White House put out, mm -hmm. there is no mention of the one China policy. There's mention of U.S. policy uh, that hasn't changed, and there is, uh, you know, the administration does not want any kind of unilateral action on the Taiwan Straits. But should we read into this at all the fact that there is no mention of the one China policy? And um, even during the NSC briefing, I'm not even sure that that was mentioned very much. Yeah. I, I, I will reiterate here there has been no change in policy. Uh, and uh, on Taiwan, the president underscored uh, that the United States policy has not changed, uh, as I just stated, and that the United States strongly opposes unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace stability across the Taiwan Strait. So we have been very, very clear on that. There is no change in the just policy. To, uh, just to, sorry, just to be clear, the U.S. still believes in the one China policy. Yes, yes. Thank you. That has not changed at all. Oh, go ahead, Alex, and then I'll come back. Could you be very clear here? Uh, given the importance of the issue. Was the White House, uh, either the pre President Biden or, or top White House staffers, were they involved in any way in the ne negotiations of the mansion schumer bill? And secondly, when did the White House learn of those negotiations? I'm not going to speak to timeline. Uh, as I said before, uh, the White House, uh, we have White House uh, senior, st senior staff that have been in regular touch uh, with uh, congressional members on um, uh, on on the negotiations and the process and what has and and any any way that we could be helpful, uh, but I'm not going to go beyond that. But, but you, you, when you say on the on the negotiations on that specific bill, or just are you just talking broadly? Because of well, we we I mean I've said this many times before. We do speak uh, we do speak to them uh, uh, to members of Congress and staff and and chiefs uh, very uh, uh, on a, on array of issues, and we stay in touch. We stay in touch. Uh, with different members. On, in this particular instance, as you're asking me, yes, we stayed in touch with uh, Senator Schumer. Uh, we, we, and we were informed, uh, informing the process in any way that we can, uh, helping work out details and policies. So yes, we had senior staff here who, who did just that and talked directly uh, to Senator Schumer and his team and kept in close touch. Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Karin. Uh, one quick question and then another foreign policy. Why President Biden didn't wear a mask today during his um, meeting with the CEOs after his doctor said he would? So he was um, 
uh, so they were socially distanced. They were far, far enough apart. Uh, so we made it safe uh, for them to uh, to be together, to be on that stage. Uh, and all, honestly, he participated and had conversations uh, with them. So he's going to continue to follow CDC uh, guidance recommendation that individuals uh, who have tested positive wear a mask uh, when around others for 10 days after symptom onset. Uh, so, but when he's at the podium, as you've seen him a couple of times since he's uh, come back uh, from his uh, isolation or, or similar circumstances today, we have ensured that there is sufficient distance uh, between him and others to allow him to, to safely remove his mask uh, in order so that he can actually engage and have a conversation. So we actually took uh, protocols today to make sure that that occurred. Okay, I know Ukraine war. Um, I interviewed President Zelensky this week and he did not rule out coming to the U.S., um, leaving Ukraine for the first time and meet President Biden. At the time, he is very concerned that uh, people are getting tired and forgetting the war. Uh, did the White House extend such an invitation to President Zelensky? I think this is a good idea for him to come here. And does the White House uh, also think this is a problem for Ukraine, people forgetting the war? So I'll say this, you know, we appreciated uh, President Zelensky's visit last year when he came uh, when he came to uh, to town here and he visited the the White House. His wife, as you know, um, uh, Mrs. Zelenska, visited uh, the president and the first lady when she was here very recently. I believe last week or maybe the week before. Uh, and uh, you know, we we maintain regular uh, touch uh, with uh, with the Ukraine government. The president uh, stays reg stays uh, in regular touch and regular communication with the president himself. Uh, we don't have any plans uh, to, to read out to you of travel and his travel to, uh, to the U.S. Uh, but, I, you know, I'll say this, you know, the president um, is committed uh, to making sure that uh, Ukraine uh, has what it needs to protect its sovereignty, to fight for its sovereignty, to fight for its democracy. And it's not just the president. We have seen uh, NATO come together more unified than they've been before because of the leadership of this president. Uh, you saw that when he went to uh, the G7. You saw that when he went to NATO. Uh, and that is going to continue. Uh, and uh, we are, you know, we are still, we, 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 we regularly announce uh, military assistance uh, that we're providing uh, to to Ukraine. We announced uh, a tranche last week, and, and we, you will be, be hearing more uh, from us about that. And so we are very much uh, committed to making sure uh, they are uh, fighting uh, against Russia's brutal war. Now, remember, this is Russia's war. It is Russia can end this uh, today if they wanted to. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to continue to support Ukraine. And then the White House think it's a problem that people are forgetting, getting tired of the war? Look, I think what it's important is for um, is for people across the globe, not just in America, uh, to understand the importance for fighting for democracy and what that means, uh, how important it is for all of us, us to stand together to make sure uh, that a country like Ukraine, who, which is a democratic country, uh, is able to uh, to fight. Uh, for uh, for their freedom, and that's what we're going to make sure that continues. Russia follow up. Oh Russia my goodness, there's so up. much. Uh, Russia follow up. Hold on. <laughs> Go ahead, in the back, in the back. And then um, thanks. I'm still just a little confused um, about the call today. You said that the two presidents discussed health security. That's pretty mm -hmm. vague. Um, did President Biden tell Xi to start cooperating in the investigations into the origin of COVID I'm, that killed uh, at least a million Americans? Yes, I'm aware how many how many Americans uh, th that COVID killed. So I'm very aware of that. The, clearly, the president uh, just dealt with a bout of COVID. And because of him and because of the work that he has done the last 18 months, uh, we are able to have a manageable uh, 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 process with treatment, and if you're vaccinated, if you're fully bo boosted, you're able to manage um, uh, uh, COVID. And I, also, I just want to remind you, since you brought this up, when the president walked in into the administration, 3,000 people were dying a day. 3,000 people were dying a day. We have gotten that number down to 90 percent. Still, people are dying, but we have gotten, because of the work that we have done, we've gotten it down to 90 percent, and we're going to continue to do the work. Uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we uh, uh, protect the American people. So, first of all, I just want to make sure that's very clear. Uh, we were, and again, we were given a disjointed response to COVID, and the president had to turn that around. Um, so, 
that's the first thing I want to say. I am just not going to go beyond what I just laid out. So that's not the answer to my question. And last August, the president said in a statement that the Chinese have not been cooperating. Uh, we're yep. going on a year now. And I just said that. In, and I just said that. Yeah, you also said that, but you, you can't tell us whether or not the president pressed Xi to be more cooperative. I'm just not going beyond. I am not going to go beyond uh, the readout that I just gave you. Thank you. Go ahead, you, sir. And then I'll continue. I'm going to try one more time, I guess, on the Taiwan question. Yeah. I know that there's not been a trip that has been announced, but does the president have an opinion on congressional delegations traveling to Taiwan? He, the president, has been a senator himself, as I mentioned, for 36 years, right? He understands this process. You, you, you do not tell a congressional uh, member where they can or cannot go. Uh, he believes that. Uh, this is up to the speaker to decide. And also, let's be very clear, there is no trip that has been announced. But I'm just saying, we, we are talking hypotheticals here. Uh, so there is no trip that has been announced. So I'm going to say that one more time. And you know what? I'm not going to get into any more hypotheticals from here. But the, go ahead. Um, the president's been considering lifting tariffs on China for some time. I'm just wondering if you can explain what the holdup is on that decision. It's, a, it's an important decision that the president has to make. He, he is taking this very seriously. Uh, and once he has the decision, we will share that. Can I also just ask about the CHIPS legislation? Um, is the White House considering uh, having someone to implement that bill like you have with other oh, that's, legislation? That's a good question. I don't have anything right now to share on, on any personnel announcement at this time. Russia follow up, Go ahead, Stephen. Thank you, Corrine. I'd like to um, first ask you a question about clarifying remarks that President Biden made to me on the lawn about two weeks ago. Uh, and then I'd like to ask about the China call. Um, on, on the lawn, I asked about whether he was planning to fulfill his campaign promise to release everyone in prison for marijuana. And he told me that uh, he doesn't believe anyone should be in prison for using marijuana and that he's working on a crime bill now. Um, so I was wondering if you could clarify whether he believes people should be in prison for selling marijuana and also whether this upcoming crime bill rules out potential mass clemency. So in April, during the Second Chance Month, uh, President Biden announced 75 sentence uh, commutations and three pardons, which are more grants of clemency at this point in a presidency than any of his five uh, recent predecessors. He continues uh, to evaluate uh, further uses of clemency powers. Uh, we, have, we just don't have any additional announcement to make at this time, uh, but I can tell you that's what he's been doing during his administration. Thank you. And on the China call, uh, you mentioned counter-narcotics. I was hoping uh, you could perhaps elaborate on what he may have mentioned to the Chinese president regarding fentanyl and also uh, relatedly on um, the China call. Um, online business records suggest that the first son still holds a 10% stake in a Chinese investment fund. Um, is it possible to have basic transparency there on whether he actually divested that stake or not? So your last questions, I would refer you to his representatives. That's not something that I can speak from, uh, speak about from here at the podium. On your first question, fentanyl, the two presidents discussed uh, uh, this issue, the fentanyl issue that you just brought up, and tasked their teams to continue uh, follow up on today's conversation. Uh, in the past, the PRC has been responsive uh, to the United States concerns about the shipment of fentanyl and it analogs uh, directly to the United States. Uh, we would welcome additional PRC attention to addressing illicit drug and per, per, uh, precursor chemical trafficking. Uh, this is an area where uh, the U.S. and P PRC interests actually align, uh, and so we're going to continue those conversations. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question on China and then one on reconciliation. The official who briefed reporters on the Biden she called today said that the two teams were going to follow up on a potential face-to-face -face meeting. I'm wondering what we should expect the conditions for such a meeting to be and when it might take place. There's a lot of talk about maybe G20 APEC in November. We just don't have anything uh, further to share. Clearly, the call just happened today. Uh, so there's probably discussions that need to be had uh, on exactly the details and, and uh, a schedule. I, it, I mean, it's just too soon, really, to, for me to speak, speak to that at this time. And on the Inflation Reduction Act, um, it was reported that Senator Manchin sought the counsel of former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers mm -hmm. to assess the impact of the bill on inflation before titling it that. I'm wondering um, where the White House sought assurances that the tenets of that legislation would, in fact, lower inflation. 
Uh, I mean, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to get into uh, uh, specifics or into negotiations. Um, you know, I, I would refer you to Larry Summers on the conversation that they have. Uh, I know that he has been uh, very supportive, clearly, of, of the act, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. I, I'm just not going to go into any uh, further details from that. And then I'll come to yeah, I have a quick question about climate. Um, What's it going to take for the president to declare a climate emergency? I mean, we've had record heat waves across the country, record flooding. There's fires in California. We haven't even hit fire season or hurricane season yet. So what's, what's the threshold for the president? So let me just say from day one, the president did not hesitate uh, to harness the tools he has to tackle uh, the climate crisis and reduce costs. This is something that when he walked in, as I mentioned, he called it a crisis last week when he was in Somerset, uh, Massachusetts. He said, we we are in a climate change. Uh, this is a climate uh, change emergency. He was very clear about that uh, and went there to talk about uh, the climate crisis. So he's never been shied away from it. He's always been a fighter uh, for it and spoken out. So he invoked the uh, Defense Production Act to make more clean energy in America. He jump-started the offshore industry, and he set the strongest ever emission standard. Under the, this president's leadership, we are now on track to triple domestic solar manufacturing capacity by 2024, supplier uh, contracts to provide materials and services to offshore wind projects have more than doubled. Uh, electric vehicle sales have doubled. Uh, there's more than 2 million EVs on the road, and we have 100,000 chargers across the country. A lot of that is also because of the bipartisan infrastructure Law. So the work that he has done uh, has led to uh, uh, improvements and in, in moving forward uh, with dealing with the climate crisis that we have not seen uh, from any other president. So uh, he's going to continue to do that work. Uh, I think it is important, uh, the, he has said how important uh, the bipartisan infrastructure, uh, and I'm sorry, not the bipartisan infrastructure, the in, in, Inflation uh, Reduction Act, there's so many, he doesn't have to keep up with them, and he has said the investment that we're seeing uh, for climate change in that uh, in that act is historic and so we're, we're not going to stop there we're not the president's not going to stop there he's going to continue to take bold actions go ahead Francesca a couple a couple follow-ups so first on chips does the president plan to sign that legislation tomorrow uh, I don't have anything on his schedule to to announce as soon as we we we, uh, we have something to announce we'll be sure to share and then on the budget bill, does he want the House to stick around to pass that bill this next month? So we want that to happen as, as soon as possible. The president wants it on his desk uh, to sign so we can deliver for the uh, for middle class Americans, for the American people. Uh, he leaves that uh, that process to to the speaker. OK, and then on his uh, his meeting with Xi Jinping, it sounds like you leaving over, open the possibility that it could be some sort of a standalone meeting that would necessarily. I, be. I honestly, it's it's a hypothetical. I do not know. Uh, I don't have any. Just we just don't have the meeting. Just happened a couple of hours ago. Their conversation just happened a couple of hours ago. Uh, we just don't have anything to share at this time. Sure. And finally, did the president propose that they meet in person, or was that the Chinese leader? I I, I don't have anything to share at this time on any any travel, anything on his schedule. What's what if if there is travel, what it's going to look like, uh, a lot of hypotheticals right there. Back on the PAC Act, did the President speak to Senator Schumer about how quickly they could potentially bring that back up, and is the President going to get involved in trying to get that passed? So I, as I think he mentioned this in his uh, 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 in his statement yesterday, he has spoken to uh, Senator Schumer. Uh, I don't have any uh, specifics on what they spoke about. All I can tell you, this is uh, personal to the president. This is uh, incredibly important uh, to the president. And I'll just reiterate that it is not the time uh, to play uh, politics with our veterans. They deserve this. Uh, they are owed this from us uh, to make sure that they have the health care to take care of themselves and their families, and we should not be playing politics with this. Do you have any updates for us on when the president will first travel now that he's tested negative for COVID? Is he itching to get out of the I White could tell House you, and get of, to Well, you know, you know uh, the president. You followed him uh, over the years. Yes, of course, he, he wants to get out there and, uh, and, and connect with the American public uh, and see them and speak to them and talk about uh, the work that he is doing here uh, for, for uh, uh, the, the, Amer the American public. Uh, I just don't, we don't have anything to share f with you at this time. When, it's, when we're able to, to uh, when he's able to go out, 
he will. Uh, he will continue to follow uh, CDC guidance, though. Oh, I gotta, I gotta, go, I gotta go around. Oh, I, I was just asked that. Yeah, I, <laughs> Steve, you're not paying attention. Now I'm not gonna answer your question. You're, I just answered it, Steve. Ask your, ask your colleague. <laughs> I ask your colleague. I just answered. Okay, I'm gonna go further back. Go ahead. Green. Um, so Naomi Biden today said that she was going to have her actual wedding ceremony on the South Lawn. Can you assure the American people that taxpayer dollars will not go toward that ceremony? I, I, I can ensure to you that taxpayer dollars would not go to that. Uh, look, I. That is a, a that is a personal uh, affair that's happening. That is not White House business. So I cannot speak to that from here. And will the press pool be allowed access since oh. it's on the South Lawn? I. Again, that is uh, a couple months away. I, that is not even something I was tracking, to be, to be very honest with you. Uh, but uh, I, I'm just not going to speak to that at this time. Okay, okay. I'm going to go to wave. Uh, now the, the one question on Africa, but one question on the president first. The, the headlines that we've seen recently, the, the Washington Post, quit Joe, quit the New York Times, President Biden is too old to run for a second term, Kamala Harris is stuck. How do you see these uh, multiple opinion pieces from the Washington Post and the New York Times? Do you see them, do you see them as coming from a good place, good recommendation, good advice, or do you see them as a hit job, an attempt to complete January 6th? by people who didn't even endorse him in the first place? Well, we definitely don't see them as any advice. Uh, I'm going to be very clear. I'm going to say this once. Uh, and uh, the president has been very clear about this. He intends to run in 2024. Uh, and he is going to, until then, uh, he's going to do the business of the American people, as he has been doing uh, for the past 18 months. When you look at the COVID response, when you look at the work that he's been doing at climate change, when you look at uh, the economy, how he was able to turn it back on when he walked in, businesses were shut down, uh, schools were shut down. Uh, we were, there were 20 million people that was uh, collecting unemployment benefits. And now we're seeing gains. Nine million jobs have been created under this president since he walked into the office. That's what matters. That's what he cares about, and that's what we're going to continue to focus on. Go ahead, Alex. And, and, and no, on, on, ahead. You, on, on you personally, I know you're a black woman, and you've been here for, at the podium for two, for two months. Have you faced any racist attack from anyone? I, we're going to move on, Simon. Go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. Um, just help us think about this moment in COVID right now. Uh, Los Angeles County, as you know, is debating bringing back a mask mandate. In the health commission, that commissioner there, Barbara Ferrer, suggested they may well do so. At the same time, we just saw the president, you know, work through his illness. Obviously, at Paxlovid, at great care, but um, there just seemed to be confusing signals. So I know you guys listen to the science, but sort of just in everyday terms, how should we be thinking about this pandemic? I, I'm not sure about the confusing signals. Uh, we had Dr. Ja here for almost three days straight um, uh, when. Uh, when the president was being was isolated, and he was very clear uh, about what the, what this moment means and how we saw this moment as a teachable moment uh, for the American public, uh, and how we are in a different place than we were 18 months ago. That is just a fact. We have vaccines, uh, we have boosters, we have Paxlovid, which is the same thing, the same treatment that the president had. Everyday Americans could have that, and they can get vaccines for free, they can get boosters for free, and they can get Pax Paxlovid from tens of thousands of pharmacy across the country. That is because of the work uh, that this president has done. And we have been very clear, COVID is still here. It has not, it's, it has not gone away, uh, but we have made some improvements and that matters. But we are gonna continue to encourage uh, Americans uh, to make sure they get uh, their vaccines to, if they haven't, to make sure they get that second booster if they haven't. And they can go to covid.gov. Uh, they can get that, they could find out where to get that free booster. They can find out where to get uh, that free Free vaccine, also free masks, uh, free tests. Uh, so go there, make sure you are protected. Uh, and of course, lastly, and this is something that um, 
uh, that uh, Dr. Jha spoke about, there is BA5, uh, which is very transmissible. It is the most transmissible variant uh, that we have seen thus far. So you are going to see uh, local governments make their own decisions, follow, we, we ask, we tell folks to follow the CDC guidance on masking and uh, depending on the cases uh, in your area. And so that's what we will continue to tell people um, and, uh, and our message has not changed. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.